Hello and welcome to another edition of Bull and Specs, or if it's your first, a special welcome. Uh, I'm Adrian Lacey. I'm in the deep south in Kent, uh, doorway to London or to the continents, if we're still connected to them, uh, depending on which direction you go in. Uh, and in the East Midlands, we have uh, young Shane O'Connor. Or at least one of those statements is correct. Uh, how you <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I thought you were waiting all of for a literal young Shane O'Connor. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he's he'll be along in a minute. Um, I don't know where he is at the moment. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. I'm good, isn't it? Been it's been a sticky old week again, hasn't it? Really, it's been just a, a bit. Yes, been quite, uh, quite uh, sweaty, Betty. I, I quite like the idea that somebody said um, on the TV the other day, and they said, "Odd," oh, and uh, something about this heat wave. And I turned to, to the wife and said, "What you mean, the summer?" Because well, yeah, it's been Which so long since it? we've had one that you forget that's mm. all it is, isn't it? This is summer, isn't it? Really, this is when we used to have. Remember, we used to have seasons, <laughs> four, seasons. Four, four seasons in one day. In one day, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I just I, it's funny how people react, and that's, we were saying it's a very British thing, isn't it, to spend nine months of the year saying, "I hate this country." The weather's bloody lousy, <laughs> and all this. <laughs> then you get four days of sunshine. You go right. I've had enough now. Yeah. What time's Christmas? <laughs> Yeah, I hate this country. It's too hot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I was speaking to a guy the other day. I was recording someone for uh, an American podcast, and he is an American uh, CEO of an organisation, and and uh, he said how hot it was. And I said, well, which part of the States are you from? He said, San Francisco. Right. And I thought, blimey, if someone from California is complaining. Then there must be something um, wrong, wasn't there? must be more. Absolutely, yeah. yes. I mean, it's the old thing about uh, humidity. Um, and <laughs> that is one of the problems with it being warm. Sorry, did you hear that car just go? I did. I heard something. It sounded like a noddy vehicle or something, but that could be uh, distortion. You see, now I thought it was a real race car at this end. It just shows, doesn't it, how it gets uh, it gets, it gets transmogrified <laughs> yeah, it into like... a jalopy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you know where the word jalopy comes from? No. Have I said this before? I'm quite pleased at looking this up because every now and again I use the word and I think I've been using that for. X years, where yeah. X is a vast number tending towards infinity. And I think, I don't have the faintest clue where that comes from. And I did that with jalopy one day. And can you think of any word that's like it? Or if I say jalopy, you'll probably think I'm taking the mickey out oh, of Manuel. Yeah. It's not. So well, it's like, sort of and sort of not. Like as in jalapeno, do you mean? Or? Yes, absolutely. It's the same town. They think, they think, in quotes I'm doing for, uh, for listeners. Yeah. Um, air quotes on YouTube. See, you pay the extra. Well, you don't pay the extra, but you get the extra. You get the visual dimension. punctuation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well worth it, I'm yeah. sure. Anyway, um, uh, yes, as far as they, the uh, dictionary people like, uh, people who obsess over words, even more than you and I, um, or you or I, um, see, I'm obsessing now, uh, they uh, th- they suspect it is the town in, I think it's Mexico, it is certainly Latin American, hence the jalapeno, it is Mexico, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, and uh, as well as uh, the town giving its name to uh, the aforementioned jalapenos, those rather hot things you put on pizzas and other dishes, um, it is a place where they've got a huge compound where they sell um rather knackered old cars from or did at one stage and so the term jalopy jalopy Jalopy. was born amazing but true no idea no idea now is that going to be too much of a distraction do i need to close that window do you think or uh, i'm coping with it i can't of course speak for the millions of uh viewers and listeners i have to because the problem is at this time of year in rural communities it's the time when they spread all the when all the muck um, you nearly said something else there. Spread, <laughs> all the, sh- all the schmuck. Yeah, all the schmuck gets uh, gets spread. So Are you calling it schmuck? There's hey. all kinds of all kinds. Do you know one thing that strikes me about? Because you know, we, you know, we've only been here since August and living in a rural <laughs> setting. The thing that strikes me is how many different types of farm machinery they are. And I look at them and I can't guess what any of them does apart from <laughs> one that carries the the slurry. That's the because right. like, that's just like a big tanker full of sh- stuff. <laughs> stuff. And, uh, I was, was going to say slurry seems to be the hardest word, yeah. but 
Uh, it doesn't work because slurry is the easiest word. Slur- it would appear. S- slurry is one of my favourite counties, actually, in the out of the home counties. <laughs> but but uh, so if it gets too much, just say, and I'm, it's only the window is only there. But otherwise, it's uh, it's a very sticky situation, and I might not get up off this seat without taking it with me. That's all I'm saying. Oh, I don't even want to think about that. As anyway, an for the people who've not uh, joined us before, and the people who have, I mean, the people who have will be going. When are they getting to the bit of what they did this week? The people who haven't heard it before won't be they'll just be going well they're rambling on a bit aren't they uh <laughs> we do in this section normally say what we've done this week can i should, can i go first it's only a quick I think online. You is that all right yeah yeah, yeah uh, sure. went to see my dad the other day and he lives mm. in a, a village about 10 miles away and um they've got one of these um junk shop antique shop I, I never know whether i'm being disparaging by calling it a junk shop but it's it's i don't think it's an antique sh- to me you have to have a certain quality of item do you think for it to qualify mm-hmm. as an antique shop you're it, treading carefully but i think we know where you're coming from it's more of a junk shop i think it's fair to say anyway talk about knock me down with a feather we're walking past you know those coffee tables that everybody used to have or a lot of people had where they they were wooden and in the center the center was cut out and in the center it was it was made of tiles like ceramic tiles that rings a bell, yeah. Do you know what Very I mean? 70s? Yeah, it's 1970s, mm. exactly. Um, so I passed one of those. We were walking down the street with my dad, and we were just walking, and I went, oh, look at that. There's one of those old tables there. And I wouldn't mind. The grout wasn't even clean on the tiles, you know what I mean? It looked like they'd spilled coffee over it and all the rest of it. So all the, the white bits in between the tiles was all mangy and mongy and horrible. <laughs> and, I, and I looked and said, oh, there's a price tag on it. And I looked at this, 75 quid. No way. And I said to my dad, that wasn't 75 quid when it was new. No, how, how not I, a fraction of that. And I, I just did a bit of research when I got home. And it's, to me, you know, talk about the value of words. The value of the word vintage mm. is, is, it's almost priceless because you put the word vintage before any old piece of tat and, <laughs> and go, it's a vintage whatever, vintage mm. dress, vintage handbag, vintage hat. Vintage edition of Bull and Specs. Vintage one that day, they, they're, <laughs> like, they're like ends teeth, they are, mate. <laughs> and, and they do this a lot. And stuff that, you know, you can go, and, well, I had one of them when we were a kid. I had one of them. We threw one of those. That went down the skip. That one we took on mm. the tip. That I had that in my first mm. flat and I threw it away 15, 20 years ago. It's amazing. It is amazing. This, this, There's a whole market out there of just junk. And they are charging now. Whether it will sell, I don't know. I mean, they're asking seventy five quid. Whether they get it. In fact, I mean, the more I think about it, I want to go back and see if there was a decimal point between the seven and the five that I missed. And, yes, and it was actually seven pound fifty. The more I think of it, but I, I don't. I know. think we should have uh, regular updates. You know, coffee table watch on the co- on the coffee table. Yeah, <laughs> see how the price is reducing each week, or whether they get around to cleaning the grouts. Do you know, the other, well, the other thing was as well, they left it outside. I mean, if it is worth seventy five quid, don't leave it on the street for goodness sake. What's the matter with you people? Anyway, mm. so that's, that's you people, you people. <laughs> uh, that's this country. That's what. That's briefly what I saw this week. Made me think. What about you? What have you been up to? I don't know what to uh, to, to to go with. I, I've got these, but I haven't got a story attached. Um, and for the listeners, uh, I've got jazz hands. I just thought I was looking around for something that would be colourful, and they're kind of I suppose they're like gay pride uh, oven gloves because they're sort of rainbow colours. Right. Um, I don't know, but uh, I just felt like uh, having something colourful in in shot. But um, don't read too much into it. All the pink carnations, you know. I'm not coming out just yet. Um, um, that's next week's as, episode. Well, exactly, yeah, I work up to that. Uh, Felix Bonness, uh, rest his soul, uh, I used to work with him um, when we were doing sitcoms. He was, uh, I've mentioned him before on Bull and Specs, uh, stand-up comic and actor. Yeah. He was in Heidi High, played the um, jockey. That's it. Uh, he was perfect size for a jockey, quite petite. Um, he was well, and, not only was he a jockey, wasn't he? The, wasn't he the? Isn't he the kids' jockey? The, he, the, the kids and he hated kids. Was that the character? That was the character, wasn't it? <laughs> that sounds believable. To, to my shame, I don't think I ever saw him in the show. I think he, I think um, that's what it was. Yeah, well, I couldn't was, remember. Him. Right, it was it was a genius twist on it. Really, it was it was a typical Croft and Perry thing, wasn't it? Where they, you know, he, 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 he not only could he be a miserable children's entertainer, but the source of his misery was the was his. <laughs> 
<laughs> was in his job title, which was just lovely, I thought. But yeah, anyway, sorry, go on, Felix Friday. Well, I was going to say, maybe he influenced uh, Itchy and Scratch. Or he, is it? No, it's not Itchy and Scratch. The, the clown, the miserable clown in uh, The Simpsons. Oh, Krusty the Clown, I mean, yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, no, the, he had a couple of lines which still make me smile, even um, beyond the grave, as far as he's concerned, rest his soul. Um, he used to say, uh, gay, I'm not even sodding happy. And another one was, um, I'm not gay, but I help them out when they're busy. Um, <laughs> see, you can't resist. Because um, I think it, his delivery was quite camp, I suppose we'd say. Uh, camp seems an appropriate word with Heidi High, which was set at a yeah. holiday camp. But anyway, um, that's an aside. Oh, I'll tell you what I was going to say, and this maybe feeds into that. I, um, I went to the gym today, which oughtn't to be newsworthy, but I'm not going as often as I should, like most of God's creatures. Mm. But coming away from it, I noticed uh, I was filling up with petrol on the way back. And what uh, do you mean, just just naturally, just filling up with petrol? I'm filling up with being overcome with emotion. I'm just I'm filling up with petrol. Is that is that something you yeah, do? Yeah, well, it kind of fuels me. The the, 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 the sadness fuels me. Um, no, see, I'll interrupt your anecdotes and see how you like it. But I anyway, it. I love it. So getting out of the car to. Um, I was going to say put the nozzle in, but that'll only get a cheap snigger from the cheap seats. No, I'd have said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Remember those days when you used to get a, a boy to put the nozzle in? Just pursuing that line. <laughs> Kids, Are stop we still it. talking about petrol <laughs> stations? <laughs> we are night. indeed. Is what this, else? Is this, this is a Felix family show. story again. I don't want to... Hang on. But, well, you know, it's, it's, I'm... I'm as it were, milking it, but um, <laughs> stop it. You've gone so end of the pier. The point is, kids today won't know there was a time when you didn't have to fill up your own petrol tank. Seems incredible now, doesn't it? It's there would quite, be a highly it's, motivated, highly educated person. It's <clears> quite a while. Although, actually, in South Africa, it's still like that, you know. Aren't there still one or two rural locations, and you're in a rural location, as you've just confessed, in the UK? Sure, there'd be. I, there I don't think, be... The, the difference between a petrol station and a rural location is they charge about an extra 20 pence a litre if they can get away with it. You know what I mean? It's because uh, the tanker has to drive out there. I mean, come on, do me a cocoa, yeah. will you? <laughs> but, yeah. Anyway, the point was as I got out of the car, I've almost lost the thread, but not quite. Thread yeah. is the word. I saw on my, uh, in the footwell of the car, um, well, it started off by thinking, oh, that's. There's a hair on my shoe, and it's obviously not mine because you wouldn't be able to see it. It's microscopic, any hair I've got. Um, and it, it, I pulled it, and I thought, no, it's not a hangover from anyone else who's been in the car. Uh, it was a, a long, blonde hair. And then I pulled that one away, and I saw there were several other. And I thought, well, this could be an interesting um, story to explain. And then I finally remembered... <laughs> That uh, preening himself in the gym, in the changing room, as I left, was this very long-haired, long, blonde-haired gentleman. Um, he was uh, taking the, the, the hairdryer um, situation very seriously mm. and, and brushing away. And that's all it could have been. And then it was also on my, um, you know, sort of waterproof swim Swimming pool side, what were they called? Swim swim shoes. Yeah. The ones you wear are the poolside shoes. There were there's a clump, at no less than a clump, I give you, of um of blonde hair. I should have kept them actually, I could have demonstrated them. They would they would have caught the light. I heard them called um, something the other day, those shoes you're on about, because I'd I'd never seen them before. I live a very sheltered life. <laughs> That's gonna worry both of us. Swim the shoes. Week, are they called it? swim shoes? Well, I don't think it's poolside shoes, isn't it? Pool- I don't know. I like rubber anyway. things that fit your feet. Yeah. I don't know. Not flippers. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. The point is that I was preparing a, uh, an interesting story about a possible denial of a romantic encounter. Yeah. Um, and then I remembered, yes, it's this guy. And he actually, wore, wore, when he eventually dried his hair, he put it up in a bun. So each to their own. And uh, as far as I know, he's not a fan of Felix Boness. I hate people like that, don't you? What, long-haired people? Yeah. <laughs> I get, really, I get really jealous. <laughs> 
You're listening to the Bull and Specs podcast. I'm Shane O'Connor. He's Adrian Lacey. Uh, Time to take a look at some of the news stories that have caught our attention and uh, fancy, if you like, for this week. The one that struck me, being a a bit of an amateur musician and actually a member of PRS as well, the Performing Rights Society, who uh, pay royalties for um, uh, music that you've written. I've got a couple of compilations in there with them, you know. I don't like to talk about it. But, uh, is that paid for your very expensive, exclusive rural retreat? Uh, this is, yes, this is, uh, I, I call it Double Cleft Palace. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were saying Cleft Palace for a moment, palette, but that's no. just confusing me. Uh, was right. the story about this, have you seen this, MEPs were, were mulling over these uh, changes to the EU copyright law. Article 13, it was, was colloquially known as. Mm. Uh, which was it was aimed at, at these um, um, what do they call them uh, user upload content platforms? I think they aren't they things things like um, SoundCloud and stuff like that. Yeah, I guess anything like that, or uh, even the um, video platform we're on, of course, oh, the YouTube, of course, YouTube and stuff like that. Yeah, as well. But well, I mean, basically, what they were saying was, or what they were mulling over was, was it a fair deal? Should these companies? Uh, some of the very big companies, it has to be said, uh, were they fairly paying musicians for the uh, work that they uh, that they were appropriating onto their site? So you know, if they'd written songs and stuff like that, were they getting the royalties that they should have get uh, should have got? It's quite mm. a complicated issue, of course, royalties because it depends what platform it's being played out on, doesn't it? I don't know if you know, but if you there's there's a a, a scale of tariff. So for example, if you uh, I think the most expensive is BBC One in the UK. So if you get a piece of music that's played on BBC One, mm. um, I think it's something like seventy-five pounds a minute to the. Uh, uh, to that the, sounds believable. To, yeah. yeah. Whereas if you if you, I don't know, the History Channel or something like that, then it can be you know as low as careful, careful. Of, five, I used to work for them. Five pound a minute or something. No, I mean it, it's based on. I think it's not just based on their viewers. It's this is why I say it's quite complicated because it's also based on. Um, the amount of music that they use, the kind of music that they use, whether they're using just mm. library music or whether they're using popular music and stuff like that. But I thought the interesting thing was uh, Paul McCartney waded into the debate um, mm. and wrote a letter to the European Parliament to say, you know, come on now, let's uh, let's everybody have a fair <laughs> dibs with this, because he obviously thinks he hasn't been paid enough royalties in his lifetime, that, that he feels that he's been jeopardised um i thought it was quite interesting he he said you know he said uh, music he said uh, it's it's the heart and soul he said they don't just happen they demand the work of so many so many people and you're thinking well mm. why don't you share your royalties with so many people then how come you're the one that gets all the royalties when you write a song it's uh, it's a bit disingenuous i think really but um what are your thoughts i, I mean he's saying art doesn't happen what, did, what was i watching the other day and i saw something it says without with, without Money, there is no art, and it's quite true, isn't it? Uh, yes, in a in a in a capitalist society, how else could it be? Unless you just want to have uh, an enca- entire um, with would be cader, a whole class of musicians who are just amateur, and that is it. There is no other way to be. Um, the thing is, uh, I am going to defend Sir Paul mm. to the extent, I, and of course, I'm completely clouded in my judgment by a. Being a Beatles fan, but I think you are as well, aren't you? So yeah, but that's not going to help his case, is it? Really, and I'll explain why. (laughs) Well, I don't know. I'll explain why in a moment. But go on. He needs all the fans he can get. B, I met him, uh, so I'm completely clouded there because I'm, you know, just in awe. Hmm. And uh, it was a little while ago because the clue is that uh, Paul Linder was still alive. So that tells you it was uh, quite a few years ago. He really loved her, didn't he? I'm always struck by. And I witnessed it. Can I can I do a celebrity anecdote? Mm, Yeah, I think so. Nice. I I always thought that was they were that was a nice. Whatever you think of him, I thought he really loved her. There was no question about that. I I saw it for real. Um, Unless you want to suggest they were performing just for me, let me explain the situation. He actually, uh, it, it happened after a Wogan show in the days when um, Terry Wogan uh, then became <laughs> Sir Terry. The old Paul McCartney. <laughs> um, Terry was uh, was doing the TV chat show. You've mentioned BBC One. It was on BBC One, came from the TV theatre at uh, London's verdant Shepherd's Bush Green. Uh, the Shepherd's Bush Theatre as... Uh, as it, uh, sorry, the television theatre, it was called then Shepherd's Bush Empire, as it's 
sort of become again, I think it was originally years mm. ago. Um, and Linda was the person who was on the show being interviewed by um, old Terry. And actually, this touches on uh, the next topic as well, vegetarianism, but only fleetingly. So I won't go there for now. But um, after the show, I, I was uh, I was a sound engineer in those days. You'll know that one or two other people uh, listening, viewing will know. But um, so I was there to collect Linda's because uh, we use first name terms. I, I wasn't a personal friend, but that's how we worked at the beep. I was waiting to collect her radio mic, went to uh, her dressing room, completely above board, I can assure you, and um, she'd just come back from the stage and and Paul was already in her dressing room and they did the biggest hug as if they were new lovers, newlyweds or, you know, just the first weeks uh, of course, by then they'd been together for 20 years, I suppose, mm. certainly 15. Mm. Um, and I was, at one point, I was the only person there apart from Paul and Linda. So if anyone wanted to be ultra cynical, suggest they were putting on a performance, they were, they were doing it for an audience of one. Mm. And then, because Paul was facing me, looking over Linda's shoulder, her back was to me as they were hugging in the dressing room. And I just waited patiently, as you do, as a mere minion at the door. And I'll never forget this, because Paul looked over his shoulder, looked at me and, and then said to Linda, oh, there's a man there waiting for your microphone, which I just thought was so lovely. I somehow thought he'd magically know my name, because I was going to say, Paul, I've been buying your albums for years. Surely you know my mm. name. I thought, it's Adrian, gonna, you know. I thought he was going to say, Linda, give Adrian a cuddle, will you? <laughs> I was probably looking a bit forlorn and could have done with one. But anyway, I thought that was a nice touch because he could have ignored me. People have done uh, lesser people than Paul, which is most people on the planet, in my view. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they treat you like an extension of the uh, sound gear. All right. Well, um, all I'm saying is, though, how you have been in the Beatles, you might have had a different view because if you, if you imagine it, no, no pun intended. Uh, if you imagine it, <laughs> very good. Um, you know, poor, poor old George Harrison. Um, mm. The story goes that that Lennon and McCartney. Oh no, George's songs were never good enough um, to uh, to to be done by the Beatles, and yet he became an accomplished songwriter as soon as he left the Beatles. And, and well, yeah. It, the interesting thing is, it's like I always use the Duran Duran as a good example of this, and Duran Duran. Um, Songs are written by Duran Duran. Whoever did it, they're credited to. Duran they are. They yeah, are credited, yeah. and the copyright goes to Duran Duran, and it goes to the five members. That's it. And he, here they are after more than thirty years. Exactly. Uh, which exactly. Is you, you know, not disconnected. Yeah. I remember interviewing Bill Wyman, and I said to him, "You know, why, why, are you, why are you going out on tour?" And he said, "Because I'm not like Keith Richard and Mick Jagger." He said, "I don't get any of the royalties." He said, "So." That's how I earn my money. I have to go out. I'm poor. He said, I've got to, I can't afford it. I've got to go and do it. All right, he's probably not poor. But again, a good example well, in the Rolling Stones where the copyright wasn't split equally between the members. Now, the, the thing is as well, it's like if you if you know they come in um, and, I don't know, Paul McCartney says, oh, I've got this song called, you know, I don't know, whatever, Twist and Shout. Or, well, no, it wasn't theirs, was it? But you know what I mean? Mm, he, he comes in mm, with a song and mm. then George will go, well, I've got a guitar part that goes like this. And they and they go oh that's Can't help it. that's you know and Ringo goes am I the drummer and uh, <laughs> and they, and they, so, you know and they all they all add their little bit to it so so surely they wrote part of this and this is this is oh well look yes you know this is where I, I do actually agree with you on that and we could mention another four piece a certain Dublin quartet called U two mm. who have been together since nineteen flipping seventy nine yeah old schoolmates. Again, I don't think is uh, uh, unconnected to the fact that every song, music certainly, is credited to U2, lyrics usually to Bono, um, but music at least split four ways. Oh. Um, yeah, so, OK, I, I I know I sound like a McCartney worshipper. Not everything about him is perfect, but, hey, if if it wasn't Paul McCartney and it was Joe Bloggs who plays down the road from you in your local mm. saying, I'm going to Brussels to... We probably say it with a middle accent. But I'm going to Brussels, like, and uh, we do allow other the... people in from other areas here. But yeah, oh, right, on. okay. I just thought I'd check that. Um, <laughs> uh, people with roots in Ireland as well, very welcome, apparently, not Mr. O'Connor. Not if we can help. Uh, <laughs> you pulled up the drawbridge. Yeah, we locked but, the door. Um, but the point is, we we aren't talking about Jay Bloggs because no one's heard of him. All due respect to him, I'm sure he's a fine musician. There are many, many 
fine musicians who aren't household names. Mm. But if you want a bit of showbiz heft, it's got to be someone of uh, McCartney's uh, stature, hasn't uh, it? But as, as a guy called, I don't know who he is, Ryan Merkley, uh, pointed out in this article on Twitter, he said Paul McCartney, whose band started out playing cover songs that would have uh, been blocked by these upload filters, now wants the EU to protect his own songs. The past always tries to control the creativity. Yeah, I saw that, that yeah. I mean, and it's a really right. good point again, isn't it? Well, except that uh, Paul might counter, well, you don't know what we would have done. You're trying to guess we were a band in, you know, in, long before Google. So, yeah, but they would, they would have played, if they played cover songs, though, the likelihood is that they wouldn't, like when they were playing on the Reaper Barn in, in, uh, in Hamburg, the likelihood is that they, you know, they wouldn't have, they were playing for eight hours a day. They wouldn't have been paying royalties on those, which they should have been even then, even back then. Well, so. I don't know, would it have been the band's responsibility or the venues anyway, if you want to split hairs on that? And anyway, I'm not very good on German copyright law. Yeah, no, it not, not very good on the UK. I mean, it's, it's, and then he goes on to say John Lennon had a more enlightened view. Music is everybody's possession. It's only publishers who think people yeah. own it, which is fine. Is that John Lennon who left a hundred million pounds or dollars? Yeah, uh, in <laughs> the the same, which is fine. Same in a hippie Lennon. commune, but but you yeah, know, in the, exactly. meanwhile, so in the real pauper. world, you know. Yeah, what about okay? You're you're picking on uh, my mates, personal friends, as you've gathered mm. um, in my dreams. But actually, Google's an absolute behemoth that makes Paul McCartney look like a pauper. Mm. They're multi multi billion pound uh, dollar organisation. However, you cut it, um, so they've got a flipping cheek if they. Take that line, um, you know, that, uh, that, that they can ignore Paul because, you know, it's just a rich bloke sounding off. Mm. I'm not saying they have said that, but, you know, they, they certainly wouldn't have a leg to stand on with that defence. And there is a case to answer there. Um, the thing is about, and, and I, this is where I think Paul should be listened to, because just forget, park his 800 million or 1 billion, whatever he's got now, and his 100 acre home uh, homestead in Rye and, you know, uh, other homes across the uh, the globe, he is actually making a point that there, Google and its like are profiting hugely from a lot of people's hard work. Mm. But, but, like, a case but, but, but like I say, you know, he, 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 as, as he has, you know, when he goes out on tour, he profits off a lot of people's hard work and, and whether... You know, there should be um, an equal split between everybody that that is contributing to him having a great show. You know, who's to say? I, I know what you're saying. And I think you're quite right. Mm. And I think the 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 people like those large platforms that you're talking about, their, their viewpoint was, "Oh my God, we're going to lose millions." That's what they were sweating on it all. And I think that somebody said that they collectively all breathed a huge sigh of relief. Mm. The, the the argument really, and I think this is what McCartney missed, is that it it isn't really about the the struggling artist, as you rightly say. This is about huge organisations, isn't it? You know that are that are locking horns and uh, and 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 trying to maybe not pay the going rate what they for what they should pay for. I I don't know. The difficulty is, and this is it's a bit like taxation isn't it in a way it's who does it all come back to you know who does it affect who does it all come back to and if they if they implemented that would it mean that the price of music would go up and then it wouldn't be affordable for kids and you know, do you remember i mean for a long time cds were at a, a certain level and then digital music exploded that model and mm. artists now say the only way to make money is to go out and tour because that's yeah. the only thing that can't be ripped off that live experience Okay, so we are in the final act of uh, this edition of Bull and Specs. Uh, on to a second news story, and I have to begin this with the memorable words inspired by Steve Coogan, stroke Alan Partridge, bleeding veggie burgers. Not being rude, being funny. <laughs> Do you remember that sketch? <laughs> it's actually bleeding radiators with a far more convincing Lancashire accent, but then, of course, he is from Manchester. Um, that's his skit on, a, I think, a central heating engineer. Uh, we are, though, talking about uh, those uh, bleeding veggie... Well, actually, not just veg veggie burgers, but vegan burgers. Um, and uh, it's a lovely headline, this. Every now and again, you, know, you see a, an eye-catching headline and it's irresistible to read. So, in quotes, bleeding, unquote, vegan burger is an, quote, existential threat, unquote, to beef industry, 
warns New Zealand MP. And you think, hmm, it's got the word existential in and vegan and bleeding. I've got to read this. And it turns out, um, I'm sure you're beautifully researched on this, Shane, but uh, just to get our audience up to speed if they haven't seen this story, um, there is actually such a thing. I mean, I don't know whether it's just one brand, but there is at least one brand of vegan burger that has got some kind of synthesised... There's no other word for it. Blood, I suppose. Synthetic blood, um, which oozes out on contact with the knife. Oh, God. Um, this sounds like, I don't know, a strange sort of Hitchcockian filmic nightmare, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, not being one who, who has meat rare, or certainly not that rare. You rarely have meat, do you mean? No, <laughs> you mean you don't. You often have meat. I often have meat, but not that rare. It's not that rare that well, I often have meat. <laughs> Put the words in the right order. Yeah. Who? I just. Why? Why would you? I couldn't get over this because I. Why would you want a? Even if you like your meat rare and you'd like mm. to see blood come out, which is why? Oh, come on, you know. <laughs> which one? It mooing next. What's the next thing? I couldn't it have understand. To be a synthesized moo. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why? You remember those boxes you used to turn upside down? You used to go. <laughs> <laughs> You could have one of those, couldn't you, with it, I guess? No, but, I was just saying, no, I don't remember the boxes. But, <laughs> no. <laughs> why, why would you, if not knowing that it's a synthesised burger, why would you... I, I didn't get it at all, Adrian, I don't... I really don't. And I don't know, yeah, because you, yeah, you can't imagine it's it's a turn-on for vegans. I, I You've chosen me, you nominated me, it has to be said. Well, only because you're pres- you're in- you told me you're a Presbyterian. <laughs> yeah, I am. And I thought, uh, well, he should he should know then if he's not a... I am, I am a, yeah, a pescatarian. Pescatarian. Putting the pesky in into <laughs> pescatarian. Let's just explain. I'm a vegetarian who's fallen off the first stage of the wagon and not completely on the ground, but halfway there by um, eating fish. But as a stand-up comic who I would love to credit, if only I could remember his name, I think it is a he, from years ago, um, he, he said, uh, yeah, well, Morrissey says, and this is a callback to a Smith's album called Meat is Murder, Morrissey of the Smiths, uh, as he was then, uh, said, Meat is Murder, but killing fish, surely that's justifiable homicide. And then he went on to say, you look in the eyes of a fish... There's no love there, um, and they're not fluffy, are they? Generally, so no. um, yeah, you'd be you'd be worried. You probably wouldn't want to eat them if they were fluffy, would you? To be, to be uh, quite I honest. don't. If you could stroke it and it purred, yeah, you couldn't eat you it. Surely, you don't really want to. You don't but want to I, I realise that's very lame. I am, I, you know, hardly worthy of the term pescatarian. It's so basically, because... you eat fish because you don't think they've got much of a personality. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> uh, it's pure selfishness, but. You could argue everything's pure selfishness, even veganism, you could say, but uh, you know, so that you could sleep at night. But for me, it's uh, it's for my joints, and I'm not talking about the sort that uh, William Haig we wants to legalise. Last week, <laughs> yeah, we've done that. What? Cannabis and swimsuits was last week. Vegan is that? That's when you that's when you don't eat any any animal products or meat or anything and you I thought eat... you were going to quote a sketch from or a, you know part of um, absolutely. Do you remember that? It's back on the radio. Again. Absolutely. Been yeah, well, yeah. That's the Absolutely. Um, do you remember, uh, was it someone and George, they were a character by Jack Doherty and an actor whose name is Casey. Anyway, they're discussing uh, veganism and one, you know, they say, well, what is it a vegan eats? And George says, or the other one, uh, a vegan, George, a vegan eats nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, which was how veganism was seen in those days. You know, you... It, it, it really was a marginal thing. That's back in the early nineties, late eighties. I'm, I'm sure I used to work with a vegan, and I'm sure that she didn't. She didn't eat meat, and she wouldn't even. She had a headache the one day, and she wouldn't even take um, the capsule uh, headache tablet. Oh, because it had gelatin, the gelatin in the, in the coating. In yeah, the, in the coating. Yeah. So she wouldn't, eat, and she wouldn't. She would always have um, uh, non, you know, synthetic shoes and. She wouldn't have mm. leather, leather in any form. They called them vegetarian shoes, which always threw me because I wanted to eat them. But uh, yeah, there was a place in Brighton. Where else? But I wonder if she had a headache precisely because she was malnourished because she would eat nothing. Well, interesting you should say that because my son is just starting to eat meat and he's seven months old, mm. and we put it in his. We have to. You have to put it in his mushed up food. Did he request it by name? Well, no, but 
Well, exactly. The the books so, on nutrition all mm. say, well, the ones that don't have an agenda, you know, to say <laughs> don't eat meat, all say that you have to give your child meat at this age because it's it, it's the best source of protein. Because I, mm. I said to Angelina, why, why, why are you going to eat meat? Why, he should just be eating vegetables, shouldn't he, surely? And she said, mm. no, you're supposed to put some meat in with it now because of the, the protein content. I thought you were going to say the digestive system wouldn't, wouldn't fully develop if it didn't I, have sort of meat to work on. I don't know. I have no idea. Well, I mean, so he's not eating, because he's, so, he's not eating solids in, a, in that sense of he's chewing egg on his teeth. Um, he's just like his uncle. Uh, so <laughs> like his dad. Was just, just like his dad's got no teeth. Um, so he's not chewing food. So like the other day he had some vegetables and we put some mince in and, mm. and zhuzhed all that up with a blender and he, and he just eats that. So, um, so I, I don't know. I mean, you, that, that's because we are supposed to be omnivorous, aren't we? So, I'm a bit I, ambiguous myself, but as, yeah. as I understand it, I thought you were Presbyterian. I didn't make your mind up. I don't know where we're going with this one. But this yeah. this whole idea, I'll tell you the really wacky thing with all of this, is if you're if you're a vegetarian or if you're a vegan or if you're against um, eating the flesh of animals, as it were, surely mm. the last thing that you'd want is a meal that resembles the dead flesh of animals. Which makes me think it is the vegan burger manufacturer trying to appeal to a more mainstream yeah. consumer base, uh, to trying to win over a few meat eaters, to, yeah. not to put too fine a point on it, yeah. which it sounds a bit contradictory because you'd think the vegan burger manufacturer would be so right on that they wouldn't even use a cardboard box to put them in yeah, uh, for fear that that would have residue of something in. But, I, I'm, you know, I'm teasing our vegan friends. Actually, what, where it's coming from for me, uh, just to go down that route, briefly is i admire them and i feel i should be much more right on and and rigorous and consistent throughout but mm. i ain't um right on cue my stomach um, just made a noise there so I, this I talk of food that, yeah, yeah sorry about that i'm it trying to edit it out but looking at the picture of the vegan burgers that's what did it just <laughs> it just, is. just remind me is is it is it and i always ask people this and i don't know whether it's the wrong thing but to do. Why? It's the question I'm asked. Mate, are you going to ask me why? I'm, yeah, yeah. Why I it, was a vegetarian? What, what, for where does, years where does it come from? Because I have to. Be, Can I, I, I'm going to answer that question with a question, like a politician, because I'm fed up answering that question. No offence to you. It's just you got me giddy goat uh, on a hot night. Why is that so important to you? Why is that the one question people always want to ask me? Because it's. I think it's fascinating to know. Um, I never what, ask you why you eat meat. What what perspective you come from? No, because because that's that's the majority, isn't it? It is the majority. It doesn't mean you don't have to answer awkward questions. Like it me. I, I don't. I'm surprised you think it's awkward. To be honest, I, I mean, I'm, you can ask no, it's me. It's not ask, awkward. It's just a bit. I'm just a bit bored ask, with it. Ask me. I've had decades of it. Ask me. Then God, ask me why. I eat meat. No, that's no, fine. <laughs> Do you want to come me. back with some? Yeah. Okay. No, I don't want to. I'm go not on, curious. Ask me. Go on, ask me. No, go on, ask oh, me. Yeah. Well, you've just answered it. You said it's the mainstream thing. No, why do you, Shane, in particular, eat meat? I'm not telling you. <laughs> Isn't it marvellous? <laughs> you knew I was going to do that, didn't you? No. no I, can't, I knew there'd be a twist in the tail. Well, let me turn the it round and ask you a question. Well, you just did. You've run out of questions. Why do I, you eat meat? 20 questions. <laughs> No, why don't I eat meat? <laughs> no, the reason, yeah. the reason, and I think it's quite interesting that you asked me that, and the reason that I think it is that I always ask people is because I'm a terrible hypocrite with it all. And mm. Well, I am, really. I'm inconsistent. I, I, I And I, I had a, a row with somebody, that a different person I worked with who was vegetarian, and, you know, and I, she said, well, you love animals. Why do you eat them? And I said, well, you know, because cause I, I like it. Um, But I, I'd have to be honest with you, if I had to kill them myself then i wouldn't i would just eat vegetables I, I couldn't kill an animal to eat it to save my life or or to end its life um mm. which she thought was you know terribly hypocritical well i couldn't argue with her but but that's just the way that it is you know there are some things in life that you just have to say hey as bruce hornsby would say that's the way it is or if I got the wrong Bruce Hornsby song, you're going to say. Yeah, I was on about Bruce Hornsby from West Brom. Who, uh, who <laughs> I was always, he in the Screw Fix ad? Who always used to say, have you seen me pants? <laughs> <laughs> I think you've lost most of our uh, Anglophone audience, which is uh, 
probably everyone. Mm. Um, on which note, do we not think that the clock has oh, yeah. uh, beaten well, us as it does? Well, well, it's well ticked its time past, doesn't it's it? It's ticked its talk, um, and we, enough talking for one week. Very good. Uh, it's good, isn't it? Yeah. Um, since I've wrapped things up, I get to choose. That's become the convention. Okay, I think. Uh, I don't know which way to go with this. Oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna just show that, that it wasn't a freak week, if you will, that I could remember all the audio outlets that you can uh, listen to Bull and Specs on. Um, we would love you to subscribe. We would love you to recommend the show. We'd also love you to follow us on Twitter. Um, I'm at Adrian Lacey zero one Lacey's with an E. He is at Shane on Air. Mm. Um, that means every Twitterization that you do is you, you're just you're Shane on Air. As, there's no private thoughts there. No. The, pro, the private is public. The personal is political or something. Oh no, no there is. Uh, uh, yeah, there is some private stuff in there as well. I really, okay. I'm really careful what I share though. Otherwise, people yeah. would just be sidling up and asking me why I eat meat. <laughs> you wouldn't let it lie, would you? And Isn't then where will it end? <laughs> and then where will it end? Yeah. Anyway, so uh, we're on a Spreaker. You could subscribe there. We are on Apple Podcasts. Shh, don't tell Shane. He thinks it's still called iTunes after two years. <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, iHeart Radio, iHeart New York. I No, that was a lie. Uh, prompt, prompt, Stitcher and Spreaker. Did you do Stitcher Thank you. and Spreaker? I, I did. I did Spreaker without Stitcher. I have non-stitched. Anyway, over to you for the the pictures. And if you're listening and you think, oh, I wonder what they look like, they sound weird. Uh, <laughs> head along to the Electric YouTube and just type in Bull and Specs, but you have to use ampersand uh, wherever you're searching because it just brings us up a lot quicker, really. And or you get mm. you get things about bulls which you might not want to watch. All of that. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I, I did. Uh, yes, I, I went down a route. I wish I hadn't. I reversed suddenly. Also, yeah. we would we would love a personal endorsement recommendation to friends, family, vicars, imams, teachers, whomever. Im dads. Im yeah. Him up there, uh, me down here. Him over there, I yeah. think you've just about offended everyone equally, so we might get away with it for oh, another week. I'm an equal opportunity offender, what can I tell you? <laughs> and, and so until the next time, it is time to bid you adieu. 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 <laughs>